today is a monumental day um, in the history of our country. Today, we not only saw a new president inaugurated, but we also witnessed the first black South Asian and woman inducted as vice president of the United States. Um, it's been obviously a very tumultuous time recently in recent months. Um, and so because of that, we're gonna leave some space open after, um, we're gonna leave this space open after the event for anybody who would be interested in taking some time to process the events of today in the past several months. So Alumni 101 Scholar and Citizen in Action for Justice and Equitable Futures is brought to you by Marshall College in partnership with the UC San Diego Alumni Office. The Alumni 101 series is designed to support students who are seeking career exploration and ways to grow their experiences and network. Topics focus on life after graduation and leverage the experiences of alumni. We're excited to be also hosting this program in partnership with UC San Diego's Changemaker Week. So that is a week long series of events aimed at celebrating UC San Diego as a change maker campus and discovering how to create positive social change through public and community service, research, social innovation, social entrepreneurship, social justice, and many other things. Um, so as many of you know, the college is celebrating a milestone anniversary this year. And our theme is grounded in our past, acknowledging our presence and imagining our future. As we reflect on acknowledging our present this quarter, I'm excited to welcome three alumni change, ma change makers who've been exemplary scholars and citizens in their work since leaving UC San Diego. And they'll be joining us in conversation this evening. Um, We'll hear about their journeys and how their time at Marshall influenced the work they do today toward a more just and equitable future. We'll also have the opportunity to hear from them and our partners at the Career Center on how we can explore ways to take action ourselves and engage in this meaningful work. Please use the chat feature to ask questions of our panelists, connect with each other, um, or for other alumni to offer any other insights. Um, a friendly reminder that today's session is being recorded and um, we don't have captioning online, but we will have captioning available um, later as part of the recorded video. I'd like to now invite TMC student Jordan Chu to lead us through our land acknowledgement. Jordan. Thank you, Provost Carver. Uh, before we start today's session, we acknowledge the history of the land on which Marshall College and UC San Diego reside. UC San Diego sits on the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay people. We, as members of the UC San Diego community, must acknowledge the legacy of the Kumeyaay people. While we might not all currently occupy Kumeyaay territory, we must acknowledge the legacy of the indigenous peoples who originally inhabited the land we now call home, work, and school. As we continue our journeys at Marshall College, we ask ourselves to consider what it means to be a student, staff, community, or member that is constantly learning and being provided with various opportunities at an institution that is one of many sources of ongoing violences and settler colonialism. Please join me in a moment of reflection while we consider that tension. In the spirit of healing and justice, we as Marshall College acknowledge and honor the Kumeyaay people, past, present, and future. In naming and acknowledging the history of the land, the people, and the cultures, we hope to disrupt the pattern of oppression faced by indig indigenous communities in San Diego, California, the United States, and around the world. Social justice issues are deeply linked, and as we learn more today, we urge you to explore the connections between systems of oppression and our common struggle towards liberation. Thank you, Jordan. Um, so the hope for this evening is for us to be able to have a conversation between our alumni team and our audience. 
So I really encourage you to utilize the chat feature, especially during the Q&A portion, although you can put in your questions at any time. Um, we'll do our best to get to you any questions that are asked by you in the audience. We also invite you to watch for follow-up information on future events with our panelists and other alumni who are living out the scholar and citizen life. <clears throat> Serving as our moderator for tonight's panel is Dr. Amber Vlasnik. Dr. Amber Vlasnik uses she, her, hers pronouns, um, serves, and she serves as Dean of Student Affairs at UC San Diego's Thurgood Marshall College. Amber came to Marshall College in 2015, right, as Assistant Dean of Student Affairs and has served as Dean for one year now. Previously, she worked in the field of women's centers for over 12 years, leading the centers at Wright State University and Louisiana State University, and serving as an affiliate member of the women's studies faculty at both institutions. Amber earned a PhD in educational policy and leadership with a graduate minor in women's gender and sexuality studies from the Ohio State University. Amber also holds an MALA from Louisiana State University and a BA from St. Norbert College. I will now turn it over to Dean Vlasnik, who will introduce our panelists and begin tonight's discussion. Amber? Thank you, Provost Carver, and thank you, Jordan, for our land acknowledgement this evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am, it's my absolute honor to introduce our three panelists for the evening. Um, first, I would like to introduce uh, Don Chavez, uh, class of 2018. Currently, Mr. Chavez works for Facebook for politics and government outreach, where he liaises with government officials, community stakeholders, government organizations, campaigns, and political organizations at the local government level in order to build their presences on Facebook through best practices and understanding new tools. Next, I introduce Iris Delgado, class of 2015. Ms. Delgado is a, an epidemiologist whose research team is funded by the National Institutes of Health to, and to determine the cause of chronic kidney disease among Central American farm workers. Ms. Delgado's team conducts research using the scientific methods. So she makes observations, forms hypotheses, writes grants, designs studies, conducts field work, um, including interviews, observations, and biological sample collection, manages and analyzes data, makes inferences, writes journals, all parts of the research process. Wow. And finally, I introduce Graciela Uriarte, class of 2015. Um, she develops, um, she is the lead organizer at the ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties. She develops strategic campaigns related to state, local, and national policy objectives at the ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties. Ms. Uriarte and her team oversee the implementation of their leadership ladder, integrating it into campaigns and, and building critical relationships with community partners in the region. So I wanna welcome all three panelists. I did um, forget to add my apologies, um, Ms. Delgado, that your title is environmental health researcher at Boston University School of Public Health. Important to note that. So can, um, at this time, I am gonna just welcome them warmly. Um, I know you will all help me give them a warm Marshall and UC San Diego welcome to our alumni panel. And I wanna thank them for joining us this evening. So at this time, I'm going to start with the first question, and I am so very excited um, to um, to have this question um, be our first one, which is uh, really about your journey. So first, uh, we'd like to start off by learning about your personal and professional journey as young change makers. Specifically, can you share about um, yourselves as public health professionals, educators, and civic engagement leaders? What is something you truly enjoy about your job, your workplace, what you do? And we didn't pre-decide an order. So if someone's feeling called, please kick us off. Uh, I can kick us off. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Iris Delgado and I am an environmental health researcher in the epidemiology department. So you can also say I'm an epidemiologist or, or a scientist or a public health researcher. Um, I graduated from Marshall College in 2015 with a major in human biology and a minor in math education. I originally wanted to be an AP calculus teacher because of the TI-84 calculator and all the cool things you can do with it if only you did it all the time. So I really wanted to be a, a math teacher. 
Um, but then I ended up through, um, you know, a lot of different, different um, jobs and decisions um, going to a school for public health. Um, so I got a master's in public health from Boston University and I got it in epidemiology and biostats. So my math, you know, uh, it came back and having to use not TI-84 calculators that were back in the 80s seems like, but now being able to code and do a lot of statistical analyses to make inferences and to be able to uh, truly de determine whether something is the cause of something. So with epidemiology, we do research to determine the cause of disease. And my research team, um, we study a kind of kidney disease that affects young people who are working really laborious jobs, uh, agricultural workers like sugarcane workers, plantain workers, uh, miners and brick makers in Central America. So my research team, we work in uh, Nicaragua and El Salvador. Uh, mostly we have multiple studies going on to try to figure out what is happening amongst this population and why is this population that's getting this specific type of kidney disease that is only seen in parts of Sri Lanka and Egypt, but isn't seen in, in the US, for example. So we have hypotheses where we think it's exposure to agrochemicals, metals, dehydration, heat stress, and maybe even a genetic susceptibility. But what I truly enjoy about the whole process is really unpacking how it is that social, political, environmental, and even the decisions of private corporations, how they, that creates the conditions for a disease, a chronic disease like this to, to persist. So just really getting into the nitty gritty of not just looking at a participant's blood, but really going deep into using uh, storytelling, their stories that they tell as data to inform uh, best practices as well. That's a little bit of the work that I do. Uh, Popcorn Gracie. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Graciela Uriarte or Gracie. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am originally from a small town outside of Fresno County in the Central Valley of California. Both my parents are farm workers there to this day. My mom came from Guatemala and my dad from Mexico. And I graduated with a political science degree at UCSD in 2015. Um, for me, my journey actually started in Mendota. I am on my mom's side. Um, her mother is our matriarch and kind of introduced me to what organizing was as a young age, I think without really, um, without really there being any like language to it. Um, so, you know, I think I learned a lot from her and I have a lot to thank her for with regards to just how I pick up on things. Um, I think for me, um, what I truly enjoy about my work and what I do as a lead organizer. So um, I landed at the ACLU in 2017 after the 2016 election. I volunteered with the organization um, for a good five months before they had a, what they called, people within the ACLU network called a Trump bump. Um, because in January of 2017, if you all remember, there, the first thing that Trump did was enact the travel ban. And there were lawyers across the country showing up to different airports to support families um, through you know, this process of reunifying them. Um, and there was an opportunity locally to hire more organizers within the organization. And that's how I got involved with the ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties. I started as an organizer and um, was promoted in 2019 to lead organizer to kind of support with the campaign strategies of our organization um, and our sister networks in California. I love being in San Diego. I love um, this community. I learned to love it through my years at UCSD. And I think I, you know, later we could speak on how I got involved in the community. But um, yeah, I just am genuinely grateful that I'm working in my calling. And um, I'll speak on a little bit more of the work that I do also later. But I really appreciate being, being here. So thank you all so much for. Um, organizing this and I'll kick it over to Ana. Awesome, thank you so much, Gracie. Great to be here and of course, join such a robust discussion. I wanna give a big thank you to also all of the team at Marshall College because without them, we wouldn't have the opportunity to be on here today. 
A little bit about me, of course, I was a proud Marshall College student. Now I'm a proud Marshall College alumni. I graduated in 2018. I doubled major in both political science and Spanish literature. And I like to consider myself a product of the Inland Empire, which in case you're not familiar, some IE education here is squat in the middle of LA County in San Diego, but towards the inland side. So I also consider myself a proud son of immigrant parents. Both of my parents immigrated from Jalisco. I'm also a proud grandson of a Brasero guest worker. If you haven't learned that in DOC already, these are folks who at the time helped fill the labor arm shortage that was happening in the United States as a result of Volvo II. And so I say that because it was really the values my parents instilled in me at an early, early age that really got me into organizing and the love for wanting to do good for our community. You know, growing up, we didn't have much, but my parents always stressed whatever we could. It was our responsibility to help others. And so little by little, I started recognizing that it wasn't just families like mine who got the shorter end of the stick, but there was many families across our community and, of course, across the country who didn't have access to good education, good health care, had to think twice about their immigration status or lack thereof. And so I knew that by going to college, I wanted to continue this path of continuing to make a difference. And so near the end of my undergraduate career, I had this really cool opportunity to get more professionalized campaign experience. And there was a chance to jump on a criminal justice reform campaign at the National Council of La Raza, now known as Unidos U.S., which if you're not familiar, it's a national Latino civil rights organization. And I got really interested because I knew that, you know, bail and bail reform impacted both black and brown people just because oftentimes, unfortunately, it was our communities who were disproportionately impacted by the system, not because of the crime we committed, but instead because of the size of our wallets. And so it was there where I really learned to enjoy campaigns. I really got into issue-based campaignings and doing field and doing some direct lobbying. And then of course, working with all of our partners and all kinds of coalitions. Once that contract was coming up to an end, just because that's how campaigns work, I knew I wanted to continue doing work in the campaign space. I was really looking to continue my work at a Latino civil rights organization. And I wanted to do work that was kind of national in scope, but local in its approach. And so then there was a wonderful opportunity to jump on board at the National Association of Latino Election Appointed Officials or the Naleo Educational Fund, where I had the chance to lead a couple of different civic engagement campaigns back in my own home community. And I thought I was really lucky because my dream was always to come back and continue to make a difference in some way. And so I was there for over two years. First, I was working regionally, working with all of our partners, elected officials, making sure everybody was ready to to get out the word and make sure everybody was counted. And then after a year being there, I got promoted to a national role where I work with all of our partners across the country to also prepare them for a full and accurate count. That's what brought me to Facebook. You know, when COVID hit, everyone was expected to take all their work into the digital space. And then we saw how more than ever technology and social media was so important. And for me, I really consider it kind of the next frontier as someone who has used technology to really democratize our institutions. So I'm happy to be building off a lot of the civic work that I did in the civic engagement, civil rights space now at a company like Facebook. And again, super excited to be here and looking forward to the rest of our discussion. Thank you so much, panelists. So this is a wonderful um, description of the present, which is our theme for this quarter as we examine our uh, anniversary. Um, so I'm gonna reach back a little bit to your past um, with this next question of, can you, um, you know, we always talk with our students about being scholars and citizens. Um, I'd like um, if you could please reflect on what it means to be a Marshall College graduate um, with that sort of legacy and training and how that might continue to influence your career and your life journey. I think one of the, the things that, uh, that all Marshall students experience is um, uh, DOC, right? And the, the, all the assignments that come with DOC. And I remember being not too savvy about anything law-based and um, I understand how health is also political back then. So for me, politics wasn't anything civics or politics or anything about a Supreme Court. I wasn't too, the Supreme Court case I wasn't too excited about before. 
um, until adult class, right? Until I heard about what Marshall, um, you know, his decision, uh, the Furman versus Georgia decision in 1972, where uh, the Supreme Court, they outlawed the death penalty for only a couple years. It was then reinstated, but um, it was uh, considered, uh, it was just, uh, I guess, discussed because there were too many death penalties being handed out. It wasn't the actual death penalty that was um, the case for a discussion or, um, but for Marshall, it was, you know, for everyone else, it was like, oh, it's just too many. So maybe we need to calm down for a couple of years. But for Thurgood Marshall, it was very much um, that the death penalty itself was, was cruel. Um, so this is where one of the quotes came from that we saw, you know, from one of the great Thurgood Marshall quotes that we always saw on the banners, you know, up top um, through Marshall College. It was the, the one that said, uh, in recognizing the humanity of our fellow beings, we pay ourselves the highest tribute. And for me, that always meant that like recognizing human dignity is the most important part of our time here as uh, humans experiencing each other, you know, in, in whatever way. So for me, in my career and in my personal journey, I think that that means a lot of understanding that health, it's not just the absence of disease, but it's access to clean water, access to nutritious food and adequate shelter. So it's being able to live your best life and that's only a possibility if we love and respect and see our each other's humanity so um a lot of the times in what you know um what i study and looking at risk factors and how a lot of times the communities you know i identify with you know low income or you know um immigrant communities central american communities oftentimes these communities off, uh, experience so many risk factors that they can't control. It's in the environment, it's in the decisions people make on their behalf. Uh, so I always thought of, you know, uh, if people don't have access to these basics of humanity, including compassion and, you know, someone to, uh, you know, root for them, then we're handing out, you know, these death penalties in, in a way where it's not, it's, it may, may not be certain death or immediate death, but it's deterioration of, of something. Um, even if we can't see it. So I always thought about that and how impactful, um, you know, just talking about humanity and human rights and law, how that seems like such a duh kind of thing, but it's it's not. So I think that for me, that was one of the first times in, in DOC, you know, where I really saw um, how important just treating each other is uh, to everything in, in, in our system. Yeah. My journey at Marshall started the summer before uh, that, the, the fall of my freshman year. Actually, I was, I'm a product of Summer Bridge, proud product of Summer Bridge. Um, and I learned actually there um, a lot around just the inequities um, and I continue to learn through DOC as Iris um, mentioned, I think but it was, if it wasn't for the Summer Bridge experience for me, um, I think that fervent and critical knowledge of knowing yourself and knowing your history and keeping that, I think, in mind for what I do now. Um, I think through some of the, the time and, and, I, and spaces that I shared in my first and second year living in the um, residential halls and in the uppers apartments um, in the think the residential life community kept that know yourself, be yourself, check yourself. Um, and I think those three things for me were critical in post-college life, post-UCSD life. Um, knowing what I wanted to do, who I was, right? Um, channeling my grandmother, channeling, channeling uh, my, mo my mom. And I think for me, um, in the work that I do within the organizing, community in San Diego, um, I think for me, keeping that in mind, those three principles is critical. Um, and also at UCSD, um, you know, in the time that I was there between 2011 and 2015, it was really critical time for the, institution um, in terms of the tumultuousness tensions that were happening within um, the university. I'd be remiss to not to mention that like my work at the at the ACLU was highly influenced by my time at the at UCSC's and um, keeping the administration accountable to the Compton cookout demands that the students organized around. 
Um, and I think that for me, I kind of just continue to utilize those tools that I learned at UCSD um, to, to the work that I do now at the ACLU. So yeah, I'll just keep it short. <laughs> Awesome. I think for me, just like Gracie, I was also a bridger and, you know, they teach, they teach us there about this whole idea of what came to be first, of course, third college, but then third good Marshall college. And I'll never forget learning about all the, all the brown and black leaders and students and advocates and communities that came together to make sure there was a college that was representative of our histories, of our stories, of our people. And I think for me, I really took a way that I needed to do whatever I could to make sure I was also helping pave the way for others. And so if it wasn't for mentors like Gracie, I would have never done things like intern at the Raza Resource Center, right, where I got to do my part in supporting Chicanx Latinx students, right? And then that, I became involved in Mecha, and I really felt like I was able to have a voice, and that was one of the first times that I felt like as a student, we had this larger platform, right, to continue making this difference. And another thing that I learned through, you know, being a Marshall College student was just this whole idea of public service. So long, long time ago, I used to run our film studies and public service minor at the college. And for me, as someone who doesn't have other, like, as someone whose family isn't necessarily in public service, and as someone who is kind of working in, I think, what you would consider a blue, a blue collar career, I had never really thought about what public service meant for me. And it almost seemed like this like super far away idea that in order for you to do public service, you needed to be like an elected official of some sort. But it was at Marshall College where I learned that all of us can be public servants in some way. You didn't necessarily need to run for office and win. You could, you know, put your part in education or in healthcare or of course in civic engagement in other ways, right? And so that was, I think, one of the first times that I started seeing myself as not necessarily a typical public servant, but as someone who could do good for the public, right? And it was then on that, you know, looking back because of these two sets of experiences that now I recognize that what I was doing in college was organizing and it was all of this that got me into the organizing world. And so definitely I think that all of us in some way or the other, even if we don't do work that's necessarily tied directly to our democracy, I think we do little or big things each day that we don't necessarily recognize that are helping make our families, our communities a much better place. Thank you so much for these beautiful reflections. It's, you know, this is, um, you, you led right to our next series of questions around activism. And I want to just take a pause for a moment and thank you, um, our panelists, for also um, bringing in our the history of our college into the work that you do and how we move through also this moment. And so, um, uh, we have a quick quote to share from Thurgood Marshall, who is part of my Zoom background. I, I prefer this 50th anniversary Zoom background because it, it changes for me the, the spaces I'm in when I bring Thurgood Marshall into the room. So um, you're always invited to um, go to our website. And you can download the entire package if you're interested um, of Zoom backgrounds. Um, but Thurgood Marshall, um, you know, is still such a presence here today. And I don't know a little fun trivia fact if folks knew that when Kamala Harris took the oath of office this morning um, to become our vice president, she swore on Thurgood Marshall's Bible. It was one of the two Bibles she used. So, um, and that was a homage to the, um, the influence he's had in her life. And she's, you know, credited him as someone she follows. And so our students also experienced that. And today was a very momentous day um, for our democracy. And Marshall said, this is your democracy. Make it, protect it, pass it on. And so um, I, I, you already started on this path. I'd like to go a little more because I think sometimes our students um, do this work now. And just as you all indicated, it was later in certain ways that you are recognizing the connection that your work as a student had to exactly where you are now, right? So it, I'd like to explore a little more the activism you engaged in on campus, the ways you were um, doing work for the public, service for the public, as Adan shared. Um, and could you share some of those examples Examples of how you were engaged on campus and how um, those have impacted your community and your network and the work that you do now. Yeah, I, I like that you start with the quote, the, um, this is your democracy, make it, protect it, pass it on. I feel like a lot of what my role 
uh, what it felt like my role was, because I, I was there during 2010 to 2015, so for five years during a very, like Gracie said, formative time in, in the institution. Um, so I felt like a, a, a big part of, of, of a lot of, like the, my background right here, um, this background when I came as, as a student, it was uh, temporary. So it, it was something that has was already made and produced through the demands of students and the you know, demand to feel represented on, on a campus like in, in UC San Diego on Kumeyaay land. So a lot of the um, things that existed, uh, a lot of things, were made by uh you know by the fanons you know the the BSU uh, pre the the um presidents and like the BSU committees you know like spaces which was I was a part of that I, Frida's here and I'm so happy to see Frida because she was the director of spaces during the time I was working there and I was actually there as a community engagement coordinator which meant that I gave alternative tours which meant I gave tours that showed perspective students of color um. The, the university that you know we made and we are protecting and that we hope to pass on. So I feel like a lot, a big part of my role um, being there from 2010, um, I'm, I'm from um, Los Angeles. So I grew up in South Central LA. My parents now live in Southeast LA and I went to school in Watts, Compton area. So my year uh, 2010 is when I graduated high school. And that's also the year in February before I graduated that the events um, transpire for the Compton Cookout, which a lot of us um, know. And if not, then there is a, a vast history now, um, I'm sure that UCSD has um, in their archives. Uh, but a lot of it was uh, me and one other student from my high school, um, we came to UCSD and she joined BSU and I joined Mecha and it just felt like a duty. It just felt like something where we uh, learned so much our first year, not just from Doc and our professors that were also there and were also activists. Like a lot of our professors, like, you know, um, Dr. Mariscal, like he was definitely someone that, you know, uh, it, it just like empowered us to, to, to say what we needed to say um, and gave us the platform to be able to do it. You know, it was a due paper, but it was still a platform, you know, at the time and it was still something that we can do. Uh, so a lot of us, you know, continued that that sense of, of activism that not only professors gave us, but the people before us and a lot of the, the people that passed on this sense of legacy that, you know, we had to protect Then it just felt like a lot of changes were happening where all, a lot of the resource centers were beginning to be staffed and you know, um, so we just wanted to make sure that uh, before the, any center existed, it was the students doing this work. So we just wanted to make sure that, that uh, you know, of, of to protect what has been worked for and um, not have it be something that if alumni were coming back, they would just say, what did you, what, what, what happened? You know, like what, what's going on? So it was always that, that, that kind of duty, um, but I was very involved in the, the physical spaces, you know, the cross-cultural center, the Raza Resource Centro spaces, the Che Cafe, having parties there. Me and Gracie would like dance there. We would like go to dances and dance cumbia there when we were um, young. It was just, it just it, a whole sense of community that um, really helped. And it wasn't, a, you know, like a formal passing of a baton or a pledge or anything like that. It was like, Community, through through community and through these dances and through these intentional like study jams or this intentional community, that's how things were passed on. And that's, I think the beauty of it that um, the people who were there during that time period, um, we're keepers of, of that knowledge and of that information and we, we value it and we treasure it. And I'm really glad that we're all able to come here as alumni because I know that um, we continue to hold, um, while loving our institutions, holding them accountable because we belong to them, but we also belong to a lot of groups that, you know, may not necessarily feel that the institution represents them. So um, it's a lot of, of, of constant work, but all of it can be, you know, done through some dance. So um, I really appreciated all the, the community spaces that, that um, UCSD and that Marshall uh, provided. Yes, thank you, Iris. I mean, ugh, take me back, right? But also um, long nights, long meetings, um, hard conversations. Um, for me, if there's anything you should know about me is that I, I keep it honest and real and I wasn't the most palatable student <laughs> to administration. Um, I, I was using my leverage as a student who wasn't on anybody's payroll, to be honest always in any meeting I was with in um, with people who had that duty themselves um, to 
fulfill the demands and needs students and the students before them came up with. Um, and honestly, <laughs> I'm proud of that. I look back and I don't have no regrets. Um, I think that for me in regards to how it impacted me and the networks that I kept around. So my advice is for students, I know that it's, I know that it's a different world to experience virtually. Um, I know Iris mentioned a lot, the physical spaces that we um, were able to inhabit while we were there, whether it was a cross-cultural center or spaces or the resource centers. Um, but if you are finding yourself a first year, second year, and not acclimating well to the to like the virtual world, like reach out to um, reach out to your friends, reach out to your whoever you're feeling comfortable with. Because I think my advice in terms of that is, I survived UCSD as a first generation um, college student, woman of color who is convicted in her identity. Um, I think that I only survived because I found my lane and I found my people. And um, for me, uh, when it comes to just those examples, I think those are my two examples is like, find your lane and find your people and you'll be able to sustain yourself through the arduous and rigorous work that is um, being a scholar and a, and a citizen, right? Being a scholar and also being accountable to your community um, and who, whatever that means to you. And I'll just start off by saying that like my generation was really lucky because even though we weren't necessarily kind of affiliated or came after the aftermath of the Compton Cookout, the Compton Cookout produced some really great leaders, right? And my generation was part of the generation that really got to absorb kind of this like student activism. And there was leaders like Iris, there was leaders like Gracie and so many others, right, who really stepped up to keep some of this work going. And so for me, what was really valuable is just being a sponge everywhere I went. I think my first year, I just had like a bunch of questions and I was like walking around campus, getting coffee with people, professors, like trying to take it all in, right? Because I do think that there is value in being able to learn from others who came before you because there are great things they did and I'm sure that there are things that they wish they learned from others and now they get to pass off all of this knowledge off. So I feel like my undergraduate career was that much more enriched, right? Because of all these leaders. You know, and earlier I spoke a little bit about Gracie when I was at the Raza Resource Center, how we did some work to retain students there. I was at Mecha, on the Mecha board at the time, and we learned a couple of things. We learned that the number of Latinx students on campus hadn't increased in like forever. We learned that the campus admin was trying to cut different Chicano studies, Latino studies based classes. We learned that across the board, there was not enough faculty of color. So these these issues was a lot of what we organized around. You know, I, I consider myself lucky too that I was a college student when Trump had just been elected. Not to say I'm lucky because Trump got elected, but I'm, I'm lucky having seen kind of this new re-energized kind of refreshed sense of student activism. I remember that night, everybody took to the freaking streets and there was like protests all over and all La Jolla has shut down, which like you would never see on any given day, right? And so that year, too, was the year that finally these conversations around a living learning community came to fruition, right, where after the Compton cookout, even though years ago the demand had been set forward that there needs to be affinity, identity-based camp, campus housing to make students feel a lot more comfortable, it finally happened, and I was part of the key core group of students who made sure that this was a demand that was met, but also we were part of the planning process to make this a real tangible thing. You know, and I need to also give Iris a shout out because one of the people that I also spoke a lot to was Iris because at the time, and she hasn't mentioned this because she's too humble, but she served on student government as the Associate Vice President of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And I was like, hey, what's this AVP thing? And can you tell me more about it, right? And two, three years after I became our AVP of Local Affairs and that's where I saw, right, like how much power we have kind of at the local level to make the biggest difference in our backyard, right? And we tackled all sorts of issues from like, you know, homelessness, which was like super prevalent, San Diego still is, from undocumented students to, you know, other kinds of like education equity and access issues. And 
now at Facebook, I get to do local level work. And I don't think I would be as passionate. I wouldn't have enough to speak about if I didn't have these sets of experiences in undergrad. So there's always, I think, some way to make a difference. It's just about taking that first step, talking to someone, seeing what you see kind of as an issue in your community, seeing what's being done or not being done. And then like just trying your best to be activated as possible. There's no kind of one way, one solution to this. Like that looks very differently for people, but I think as long as it feels authentic to you and you feel like you're doing right by your communities, I think you're definitely on the right track. Thank you so much. These for, we've, we're bridging into words of wisdom, which I just so appreciate. Um, and so we had some, uh, we have a quote now from Iris that was put in the chat. <laughs> and uh, I, I wanna pull out um, Graciela sharing, you know, find your lane and find your people. Adan saying that, you know, take that first step. There's no one way, one solution. Um, you know, be, be authentic in searching that out. And I just want to ask if you have any quick final words of wisdom. And if you could, our students now, as you know, are experiencing their education, at least for this year, like this. And so do you have any particular advice for um, our current change makers at Marshall College, our students who are really um, experiencing something very different. Um, and, you know, as we go back, in, as we, as they continue to navigate now, any words of wisdom from the three of you um, or advice um, for our current students would be greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, whenever um, anyone asks what, what they need to do or how they should be, uh, or what they should study to become a public health researcher or get involved in public health, um, the first thing I always ask is, uh, who who is public to you? Like, who who do you care about? You know, like, what population do you really care deeply about? And for me, you know, the answer to that was um, people in Central America. Both my parents are from Nicaragua. They came to the U.S. in the 80s um, because, of, and they sought political asylum. So they were always given permission to be here. And they weren't allowed to go back to their home country for 20 years, given the asylum, you know, but they were still, they had a line to be in and they had, uh, you know, the ability to think about going home and they have, and they have so many times and now, you know, they're, they're, they're citizens and they're, they're getting all of their, you know, all of the, the things that that means. So I think that um, when I think about the population I care deeply about, I think about how many people are, are studying them and how many people are studying them that don't look like them, that don't talk like them, that you know don't really know about them from like an anthropologic or a, you know like um, a societal or even just a lens of like compassion and, and human dignity and decency and what that means in that context. So something I I just always believe that people who care deeply about a population and, and know that population really deeply, um, there are people researching them. And um, if you're interested, you know, like for an example, if, if, if you're interested in opioid abuse in the transgender community, you know, all you look up departments and schools that are already asking these questions, because I assure you, they're waiting for a research assistant to come and ask, or someone to come ask to assist them in their research that, that not only cares about this, but has a lot to offer that they don't have. Um, so I definitely always say that people with a compassionate heart and people who are Marshall College graduates are perfect for public health and Alan does public health, Gracie does public health. They, you know, do work in a, a political field and they do advocacy work, but it's also always for the good of, of the public and it's always, um, you know, just keeping in mind that it's it, we, uh, human rights, you know, human rights is at the core of everything. So just, um, now that everything's online, um, you know, I was a student at Boston University and I was looking up a research team to be a part of and I didn't even know the research team. I, my dream research team was already at my school, you know, so I did everything online where I just could have gone, you know, next door or to to um, uh, two floors up to to go ask the question, but I looked it up and I did everything as if the person was in California at the time when I was in Boston. So everything that um, you know you can do, we obviously can only do things um, online and in a special way this time around. But the way that people go into asking about public health research hasn't changed. It's all online, and it's all through going um, to those departments and going to you know copying that the email of the person that's in charge of that department and emailing them. Because I assure you, uh, they will definitely email you back because people are always 
looking for people um, that have that initiative um, to come. So that's something advice I would give for anyone considering uh, public health or, or research of any kind, who is public to you and um, in what ways uh, do you think and do you know that what you have and what you, your learnings and your skills, um, they're necessary in, in the field. Thank you. Um, my advice or words of wisdom are to be true to you and to have coffee, like Adan said, even if it's over <laughs> Zoom, um, with someone that you think you could learn from and who you think could also uh, learn from you. Because I like whether whatever one-on-one -on -one you're going to walk into, it doesn't matter. The table will be round, <laughs> and um, you can end up on either side of it, right? Um, and I think that that it's important to to be able to like take that initiative um, that Iris was talking about earlier, um, because I think I think back in my time and the reason why I was so um, diligent or like. <laughs> I guess I, I, there's a better word for it, but I always thought of people in positions of power as like people like me, they put on their pants the same way. That's my, my dad always said. So I was like, look, they're, <laughs> I'm, we're gonna have this conversation and um, we come in with the same amount of knowledge, <laughs> at least I thought. Um, and it's always, it's always um, fruitful to be able to um, just, have those conversations with folks. So be true to yourself and don't be afraid to reach out to folks when you have questions. From my end, I'll just say that I think one of the things that really helped me in undergrad was doing just like anything, everything. And I say that just because you never know where you're gonna end up five, 10, 15 years down the line, right? And I remember in undergrad, I did like all sorts of really cool things from like, you know, intern at a think tank or be at a union or intern for a congressman, right? And I think this is definitely a time to explore all of that because even though you might say, for example, be in the public health space, you might get into civic engagement. There's nothing wrong with public health, by the way, no shade iris, right? Or if you're in the civic engagement space, maybe you get exposed to this like awesome public health opportunity and then you want to be a public health professional. I think one of the cool things kind of in retrospect now is that we can do anything, everything from this side of the computer because nobody's meeting in person, which means that the future and the possibilities here are really endless. And I'll just end by saying another quick thing. I think a lot of us oftentimes are, are, are already or are going to be kind of the only person of color, woman of color, young person in the room. I still experience that to this day where like, I'm literally a kid compared to everybody else that I'm speaking to or meeting with. But looking back, I think it's important to recognize that we bring as much value to the conversation. We're able to contribute just as much, if not more, especially given all of our intersecting identities. And so do not think twice, do not tell yourself no, do not like, you know, discount yourself out of an opportunity before somebody else does it for you. All of our ex perspectives, experiences, and mindsets are valid. And in fact, we're able to take rooms to new heights because we're in them. So definitely just go for it. Don't hold yourself back and you never know where you're gonna find yourself. That was a beautiful, um, beautiful set of advice. Thank you so much. I can't wait to see the video to rewatch all that. <laughs> um, so I can make sure I can soak it all in. I want to um, let's please give a huge round of applause to our panelists. Um, it's actually like nearing the end of our time together. Um, and uh, I appreciate that they have answered a few of the questions that are in the chat. Um, and so if they want to continue to do that, I want to just take a quick moment to again, just thank you so much for rejoining us at Marshall College and at UC San Diego. And before we wrap, um, I'd like to invite uh, Mike Strohmeyer, Associate Director at the UC San Diego Career Center to talk a little bit about career building resources, tips and tools available through his office, particularly important given that things are a little different right now. Um, so Mike, would you please share with us how you see the job market changing at the moment and what career professional resources exist through the Career Center for our students? Sure, I am. Sure, happy to do so. Um, 
In terms of uh, the Career Center resources, um, I think I would start out with just the main Career Center itself um, and say um, all the things that you've heard today, there's so, many, uh, so much wisdom there and so much truth. Um, there's a lot of different paths to go different ways. And these are just some basic kind of fundamental resources that we have out there. There's a Triton Career Guide uh, that's out there, um, a health beaker guide that includes public health and uh, dentistry and uh, MD, M, uh, MDDO, all those kind of things. It's part of that as a program that we have. Um, and the competencies, which is something that are really important to see that you have these kinds of things that employers want to have. And um, I'll take a, a moment before I pause to go into Handshake, which is actually another resource that we have built into our program and talk a little bit about uh, kind of where, where we are and uh, potentially uh, kind of where we're going to in terms of um, asking that question. Uh, the, the, the million dollar question is that uh, we really don't know. Uh, we're in a place where we're in a pandemic and we are doing a lot of uh, virtual things these days and things are changing. And so um, being prepared, um, and I can tell you what you can do in terms of being prepared and being ready, career ready and uh, learning about those things really do help you um, get you to a place where you wanna be. Um, so um, in terms of um, appointments, one-on-one -on -one conversations, having this with your friends, your family, of course, with career coaches, um, there's opportunities on Handshake to do this. Um, this is resources for, for all students um, and alumni have these resources too, actually. And uh, part-time, full-time internships on campus jobs and you know, getting connected as much as possible as you can through things like, uh, like um, you know, LinkedIn and things of that nature, as well as information sessions and presentations that are going just directed for UC San Diego students. Um, and there's some really kind of cool uh, legitimate resources that we have that are really great in terms of what they offer and like big interview, or if you want to practice or your virtual interview and those kinds of things, that's a great resource that you can go on Handshake and then uh, look at the resources and do that. Uh, going global for a uh, lots of different kinds of resources outside of the, the media community as well as H1V and things of that nature. And then one of the ones that people do like a lot is what to do with this major, just kind of looking at some of the opportunities and things to get your, your, your thoughts started. So I guess the thing is, is that um, we don't know exactly where it is where we're going. Uh, things are changing all the time. Um, and, you know, getting connected, being with people, uh, building your, your relationships and your opportunities through those kinds of things and being as prepared as possible really are great ways to help you in, in, your, in your road ahead. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess those are some of the things I'd like to mention as we talk about the Career, career Center resources, just as a basic slide here. Uh, feel free to connect with people one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, or in groups or in the presentations too. And of course, remember your, your, your network is not just um, you know, professionals, but people all around the area, your friends, your family, people that you've, you've never talked to and want to have a conversation with, or that cup of coffee as was mentioned. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, and thanks to each of our panelists and to Dr. Velasnik for tonight's thoughtful conversation. These things always end much faster than I want them to. Um, we're really honored to share this college's legacy with so many amazing alumni. And we really hope that you all continue to share your work with us and with our current students. I also wanna thank Katie Nugent and Krisha Patel and the student committee on the 50th anniversary who helped bring um, shape to tonight's program. I also wanna quickly note an upcoming conference for our partners at alumni will be hosting next month. That's the Triton Leaders Conference towards advancing equity. The work to advance the themes of equity, diversity and inclusion is a collaborative one. So we invite you to join us on February 5th and 6th for a weekend of advocacy and empowerment. On the screen, there are just a few of the sessions that are being offered um, featuring some of our fam fabulous college alumni. Um, and there, if you look in the chat, there should be a link with some more information. And actually for Mike, if you're still on, there was a question from a student um, about um, counseling, career, uh, career counseling. If you are still on, if you could answer that in the chat, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> so to close, um, in this 50th anniversary year, we're getting grounded in our past, acknowledging our present and imagining the future of Third Thurgood Marshall Lumumba Zapata College. So to close our program, we invite you to share with us in the chat your response to um, the following prompts. So the first is, my hope for Third Thurgood Marshall College is blank. Um, the second is my hope for student experience at Thurgood Marshall College is. 
So um, please put your thoughts on those into the chat. If you're interested in staying connected during our 50th year, we invite you to visit marshall50.ucsd.edu um, to learn more about how to stay connected in some of our, our upcoming events. Um, and in partnership with alumni, I'd also like to invite our students, staff, faculty, and alumni to help us tell the story of the college by contributing to our March Marshall College virtual yearbook. Um, we're gonna put a link to that in the chat if it's not already there. Um, it also can be found on the 50th anniversary webpage, which again is marshall50.ucsd.edu. So thank you again for joining us on this historic day and especially thanks to our recent alumni for sharing your experiences and your wisdom with our community. I'm struck by the fact that our previous alumni 101 was with founding alumni and was really inspiring. This is with some of our more recent alumni, also really inspiring. So I appreciate you um, showing up for this. Um, please remember to stay on if you'd like a space to discuss and process today's presidential transition and inauguration. Thank you so much.